Hi everyone, my name is Maria Konovalenko and I have the honor to ask Robert Schmuckler-Ries, um, the um, um, record holder for um, life extension in nematodes, the, the 10 fold um, life extension record. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you, Robert, several questions about life extension research. So, what do you think are um, the main research trends in um, longevity in, in life extension? Well, right now we have we have some very exciting uh, avenues of investigation that and and I think also some important theoretical perspectives that have helped in understanding uh, how lifespan is determined and limited so the the first uh, that was discovered in the nematode I work with the little worm C. elegans is the uh, insulin and growth factor IGF-1 uh, signaling pathway that uh, clearly is very important to uh, limiting longevity and and yet, even though we have many uh, insights into the process of lifespan determination through this, it clearly is not a pathway that evolved to control our lifespan. It evolved to control reproduction or, or cell division, but not, not to limit things. Uh, we do have uh, other pathways that are, that are looming as uh, perhaps equally important, but uh, still a little earlier in their investigation. One of these is the uh, handling of, of protein degradation uh, through the proteasome and, uh, and uh, the, also the chaperone pathways that precede that. So I, I think there is there's much to be learned about underlying processes. There is a, an understanding that inflammation is very important and that these two can be intimately connected because um, uh, a variety of types of damage, oxidative damage, but also uh, um, chemical damage from metabolic uh, byproducts and, and environmental uh, toxins can also lead to the kinds of damage that, uh, that, that need to be regulated and controlled and can, can be inflammatory when they're not controlled. So what we see with aging is an increase in, in, in inflammatory response and also in uh, non-adaptive uh, protein production. And all of these can therefore perhaps be synthesized into a common framework where we see uh, tissues and the cells they comprise becoming increasingly detuned from the, uh, the needs that are required for homeostasis. And so there's a potential now at last for a meaningful uh, development of therapies. I, I think this is for the first time in our history is now a realistic goal and I hope we can achieve it. Yeah, this brings us to, our, uh, to my uh, second question, in, which is which areas do you believe have the most potential in um, increasing lifespan in the nearest um, in, in the nearest several years. So I've thought about this, and you know we already have uh, the only method available that is shown to work in a variety of species. Not yet in humans, but uh, it will take longer. Anything is, takes longer to study lifespan in humans, but. Dietary restriction, restricting the intake of calories, particularly protein calories, uh, appears to be very effective in extending human lifespan. The remarkable thing uh, to me is the very low rate of, of adoption of this, um, even though, as, as I say, the evidence has been there for uh, decades, many decades. Um, now, what makes this, uh, I think, a little more exciting uh, for the near future is the potential to modify foods so that we don't need the willpower that I think is lacking to uh, adopt this strategy of life extension. So we could have synthetic foods, maybe not so tasty, or maybe we need to uh, study the, the diet that I prefer, which is a vegetarian diet, and see if, if it confers uh, the same benefits and extends life in the same way. 
Um, after that, I, I think there is uh, there's a potential for um, pharmacologic interventions. I think that now that we know many pathways that are involved in uh, controlling lifespan, and as I said in response to your first question, Maria, the uh, in some ways the um, focus on this is a little bit uh, misguided because that's not what these pathways evolved to do. They are pathways that we know if we, if we block them, if we disrupt them, that we will extend life. Uh, this would not have happened in evolution because there are pathways that are needed for reproduction and immune protection, but in the protected environment where we live and the overpopulation where maybe we don't need to reproduce quite so much, uh, this might be quite acceptable and so I think that uh, pharmacologic interventions uh, cannot be far off and frankly they are much more readily adopted by people than the simpler thing of restricting calories because it doesn't take it it doesn't take any willpower to take a pill in the morning even though the risk may be higher people will do, they'll do that so in the longer future, I think that uh, uh, regenerative medicine has a lot of potential. I, I have hopes and, and some interest also in um, a higher technology interventions that may involve uh, nanoparticles and uh, the ability to actually uh, try to repair some of the damage that aging does. Uh, right now, that's all pie in the sky. We don't know what can be done and with what risk. but. Uh, for the longer term, that may be where the greatest hope lies. So what genes do you believe are the most interesting ones in genetics of aging? Well, of course, my, my attention has been focused on the uh, phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase, the gene which, uh, when totally disrupted in, in the roundworm, uh, extends its life tenfold. I, I think it may have this, this leveraged role in affecting lifespan because it, it, it plays a part, a critical part, in many of the signaling pathways, including the TOR pathway, including the AMP kinase pathway, uh, a, a, the mTOR is the nutrient sensing pathway, the uh, AMPK is a stress and damage response pathway and the, uh, the um, variety of MAP kinase pathways that respond to stresses and to some extent uh, stimulate the, uh, the innate immune response. Uh, if all these pathways can extend life when they're disrupted and you have one common factor that's needed by all of them to work, then of course you have a bigger effect if you disrupt the one common tether that, that links them together. So maybe that's why that's uh, the most dramatic effect. Um, I'm not sure that in the long term that this is where we should focus all our attention. I, 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 maybe I do myself a disservice because, as I say, I, I, I like this pathway. But I think there is uh, a lot to learn uh, about basic research on what are the the proximal mechanisms of aging. You know, the fact that you can disrupt so many pathways and extend life tells you that those pathways are upstream and that somewhere they must converge downstream on whatever it is that actually determines how long we live. And discovering that point of convergence is, I think, where all the ultimate excitement lies. If we know how they act on our cells to make them more or less fit, then we will, we will know really where we can intervene most effectively. And uh, I think we're not far from that. I see. But uh, in order to make those break breakthroughs, we need basic research. And now, um, unfortunately, we see a lot of um, interest towards the applied research and uh, could you please comment on that what do you think should be should be done what what's the balance should be well 
As you know, Maria, for, for many decades, the United States has been at the forefront of basic research. And through our public funding of basic research, which has been the strongest in the world, we were basically at the forefront of many, many, many uh, fundamental developments, which then maybe found their practical applications and their subsequent development in other countries, which perhaps could produce products based on the, the basic science. But unfortunately, as the, as the world is in an economic recession, the, the money has been very limited in research as a whole. And to compound that problem, the, uh, the, the proportion of research money available has been shifted now away from basic research into something with a more immediate payback because everybody is a little short-sighted, I'm afraid. They want to see something uh, that they can, they can, they can uh, demonstrate to, the, uh, to, to, to uh, their audience that it's, it has an effect on human well-being. Basic research often doesn't show its, its uh, true value until after it's been translated. But to then think that you don't need the basic research is missing the whole point. The basic research is what underpins the, the clinical applications. And if you don't, if you, if, if, if you throw up your hands and say, well, you know, we have enough basic research now, we don't have to do any more, our future is jeopardized. So, Robert, could you please tell me what other uh, stumbling blocks for aging research do you see? Well, ultimately, I think they stem from the shortage of available money to support research. But there's been a more pervasive effect as a result of that, which is that when only less than one grant in ten to do research is actually funded, and those are being pushed towards clinical, translational science rather than basic science. The few of us doing basic science uh, are finding that the grant funding uh, process is becoming increasingly conservative so that no one wants to fund high-risk research anymore. It's all uh, basically researching things that are safe projects and that means that uh, discoveries are less likely to happen. Uh, that's a terrible shame. It's especially uh, also a problem for younger scientists. Now, it's very hard uh, to recruit scientists into the field, and in fact, uh, I'm not sure that I can, in good conscience, give a, a young uh, PhD student the advice that this is the, the career he should pursue, because in many cases, it's, uh, it's not a very sure career. It's not, a, it's, it's, it's not sure that he will have a job or she will have a job it's not so sure that they will have funding either to do the research. Thank you very much. Thanks okay. a lot. Okay. Thank you.